Kia ora. Uh, today I'm going to take you through my way of choosing fonts. All right. Uh, I hope everyone's caffeinated. I am. Uh, let me first show you where we actually end up today. So we'll kind of start here figuring out which category of font is right for our logo. We'll start exploring font families. We'll get inspired by other designers and explore some of the hidden secrets of type. Then we'll choose a few finalists and mock them up to see if we're on the right track. All right, uh, to get started, we're gonna go to fonts.google.com. Okay, this URL here, and we're gonna use Google Fonts mainly because it's free and it means everyone can play along. There are other places and potentially better places, but Google Fonts is great. You can download them for your desktop. You can use them for websites and apps, so it's pretty versatile. Uh, what I want you to do is where it says sentence, type in the brand that you're working for, okay, or doing you know, is your client. So for a lot of you, you're not gonna have anything, so just type in your last name. Okay, and you can use that for this video. So my last name is Scott, so that's what I'm working with. Okay, uh, but I've actually got a client that I'm working with, so that's called Adair Bikes. So we're gonna type that in. And then what I want you to do is just pick a font that, a uh, font size that's appropriate for the you know letters that you've got in there. Now, where do we go from here? Uh, my younger self would do this. I'd start by going to horrible font sites where there's lots of ads, and, but the fonts are free and avoid paying for them. And I would find terrible, terrible fonts. Okay, load them all onto my computer and then jump into Illustrator and do something like this. So I'd type out the word, I'd click in the old character panel and then can start to smash away at the old down arrow until I've, oh, oh, come back a little bit. Oh, yep, that'll do. Next one. And I end up with some fonts, like it's a way of doing it. I'm not judging, uh, but it's gonna be, uh, it's very hard to justify to anybody, yourself, the client, like why you picked this font with the old down arrow smash technique. So we need to set ourselves a few creative boundaries, at least I do. I need like a place to start, um, some kind of rules of engagement so that I can exclude a lot of this like full creative freedom, which is like no freedom at all. We need some some boundaries, some fences to help us kind of focus on what font we should be picking. And that really comes down to the brief. Let me kind of give you an example. All right, so let's start right at the top. Pick the best font ever. That's way too hard, so we can't really go anywhere. So let's add some boundaries. Let's pick the very best font for logos ever. It's better, a little bit more concise, we're picking for logos, but still way too hard. So what I'd end up doing is just picking fonts that I like. I'd pick Musio probably to start with because it comes in all these different weights and sizes and versions. Musio, love it. Then I'd pick Avant-Garde because Avant-Garde is good and it's safe and it looks great as a logo, I think. Then I'd pimp Lust. I am trying to get Lust into basically every second job I work for. I'd pimp Lust. I am trying to get Lust into basically every okay. second job. I realize this is a really poor choice of words. And I honestly, at the time, I didn't put to do the two together. But editing after this weekend, I realized that I couldn't just let that go without commenting. Or at least I'm aware of how bad that was. All right, let's carry on. Ignore the word Lust. I am trying to get lust into basically every second job I work from, mainly, no for other reason other than I really like it. It's got some really great ligatures and extra bits, and it's really pretty. The problem with doing this though is that I've picked fonts that I like, and this brand, this font is not for me. So picking a logo font, not good enough. Let's say now that we're picking a logo font for a balloon company. Bingo, uh, balloon font, uh, island balloons, job done. It's balloony. Let's now get even clearer about our brief because we found out this balloon company actually specializes in high-end custom balloons. Bam, look script, perfect. It's got some weird stuff going on with the R and some tracking maybe. Okay, but here we go, chasing the brief. Now, I'm not pretending to be like the best font picker in the world, I'm definitely not, but you can, I guess you can kind of see where we're going here. A really clear brief helps us get even closer to the 
audience, not the client, okay, but the client's client, their target market. So let's dig a bit deeper with the company and the brief. Let's say that uh, it's an Irish balloon company, they specialize in kind of high-end custom balloons, but, but their main client is you know corporate event planners okay and event organizers now that's going to change like up until now i've been designing for kind of the customer b2c experience now a b2b client they are going to have such a different need from the brand as in they, they're going to be used to different things let's maybe we'll try this something a lot safer. They're organizing big events where there's a lot of moving parts and they don't want Fun Dan who may or may not turn up on the day. They want rock steady corporate, knows how it works, uh, Ireland balloons turning up on the day and doing their job professionally. We might even end up with, you know, like serifs to go even more like uh, safe and kind of show a bit of uh, kind of, you know, old worldy standards. So you can see how with a very clear brief, we can potentially like, again, this is just a little thought experiment, but I hope it shows you my point of how important a brief is. It's funny that I kind of ended up with that really quite sensible font and out of context, you would think that's a, you know, really bad logo font uh, for, a, for an exciting balloon company. But in the context of B2B corporate safety, it makes, it may not be the one that you like or think is right, but you can see how I got there, right? Uh, there are fonts that like I vow never to use. I'm never in my life going to use Trajan. I hate Trajan. There, I said it. I don't like it. I'm never going to use it unless uh, I'm making, say, a movie poster for like, a, you know, a sci-fi movie that kind of starts with the inner world. In a world where the only font is Comic Sans, one renegade designer with hairy arms and glasses will bring serifs back to the world. <laughs> All right, uh, let's... Focus again and let's talk about homework. So your first bit of homework, it is a nice easy one. You just have to have a company name you're working for. So if you don't have a client like I do, um, and you're not following on from the last episode in this series, okay, uh, what you need to do is take your last name. Actually, let me quickly show you. So if you don't have a name, use your last name. So my last name is Scott. And then use, what are you selling? Okay, use this uh, random object generator. Okay, and this is the URL here. Uh, I'll leave a link in the description. Actually, there'll be a worksheet for these videos, so check for the link um, in the description for that. And uh, what I want you to do, think of your lucky number and click the refresh button that many times. So my lucky number is three, one, two, three. And you have to pick something from here. So I'd be Scott Candles. I'd be Scott selling pool stick. I don't know what that is, an ice pick. Ooh, but okay, flowers, pine cones. So if I picked Dan's pine cones, Okay, that'll be the company that I'm going to use, okay, Scott's pine cones throughout this um, video. So you do the same and I will see you in the next bit. So we've established that the brief is super important. Uh, and let's say that you haven't got a really kind of robust brief with, you know, you've done lots of client development, a lot of like uh, customer development and personas. Let's say that you haven't either, you're not at that place in your career or that just not in this particular job or you're working on your own project. Uh, let's look at doing a kind of like a little skinny down brief. Uh, for me, I need to know two basic things. I need to know who the target audience is, okay, who their ideal client is and who their competitors are. And from that, we can kind of I don't know, help us set up our boundaries for picking our font. Now, when it comes to the target audience, it ideally should come from kind of well-researched kind, you know, customers, you know, uh, customer interviews, research projects. And in this case, uh, with this budget, that's not possible. So it's going to come from my client. And in this case, it can be tricky because there's two uh, kind of co-CEOs, if you will, and. Uh, two of the, like uh, Jane, who's the wife in the team, she had no idea. Like I asked her who it was and she, she didn't have an idea. So she's never going to be satisfied. It doesn't matter what I bring in terms of the font or the logo or the color. She's not going to know, uh, you know, she's not going to have any sort of idea to kind of base that from or come from. So that was, uh, you know, something we need to work on. And uh, John, the husband, he had uh, like vague ideas. He was like, there was some sort of like, think Apple plus leather, <laughs> that's what I took away from the conversation anyway. So I'm not sure how I could win that one like either. So 
a lot of my time for the beginning is getting them both, I guess, on board for who the client is. There was a lot of to and froing just via email about who the client is. And eventually we landed on, uh, they were male, they were in their 40s, they were professionals, they were hobby writers, not professional writers. They did it for um, a mixture of exercise and social life. They, their really big concerns when they came into the store were all about the technology, the engineering, the materials. That was something that they were really, you know, was really important to them. So even just doing that, and agreeing, we all three of us agree that this is their ideal client. This is the person that brings in the most joy as a client. They're the best to deal with. They pay the best. Um, you know that they, they, they come back for other things. So we decided that was their target market, and it's just really important to get there because, like, getting them to buy in to a project is like all the projects that have been terrible. You know, like branding projects that I've been a part of or done myself is always been no buy-in from the client, or at least you've been trying to say, you've been convincing somebody lower in the marketing team of what we're doing, and they agree to it, and then they go off, and you don't have a direct connection to them, and they go off and take it to some sort of board of directors meeting and come back with like, nonsense, my dog doesn't like green. And you know, there's that disconnect, there's no buy-in from the customer because you don't have contact with them, or, a lot of my early stuff is I got given a brief, whatever they would give me, and that I'd never asked for anything else, and I just start hitting and smashing the down button in Illustrator until I found a bunch of fonts and threw them all at the meeting and see if they liked any of them. So getting good customer buy-in helps if when you turn up with those fonts and they understand who the client is and we can get less personal. Uh, customer's dog's not involved with the design choices. Uh, so yeah, uh, getting the target market sorted first is super important part of the brief to kind of move forward. So I said there was two parts to moving forward, the target audience, which we've kind of uh, developed, and looking at competitors, so a bit of competitor analysis. Uh, we did this in the last video. Let me show you what we came up with. So this is the competitor analysis we did in the last video. Uh, they're pretty easy to do. Uh, you ask your clients uh, who their competitors are, ideally the ones that they respect and would like to be like. Uh, and then you go off, throw them on a page, and then go and find lots of other ones, okay? A nice big industry kind of scope of what's out there, throw them all on a page, and in terms of fonts, you can start to see already there's some pretty clear um, signals and trends in terms of what type of font, you know, the categories, the styles, the families, the weights, they're all starting, I can, I can see them in there already. So, uh, yeah, that'll kind of... Uh, be your next bit of homework. So homework number two will be for you to get clear on your audience, okay? Uh, the target audience. So do that for your fake company, if that's what you're doing, and do a bit of competitor analysis. Produce a document like this. Doesn't have to be an illustrator, just something PowerPointy. Google has tools. Uh, do something, throw them all on there so we can move on to the next step. Let's talk classification or categorization of fonts. It's just a kind of a term used to group fonts together, okay, different styles. So the main food groups are serif fonts, uh, sans serif fonts, display fonts, monospaced, and then handwriting script fonts get its own little category. Uh, within those kind of like high level categories, they all explode into kind of other, uh, you know, subcategories. So let's say display fonts is a big one. Uh, there's lots kind of crammed into there. So if you're looking for a, like black letter font or say a wedding font or a stencil font or the very important um, uh, cactus subgroup of fonts, uh, that's all going to be like wedged into the display font group. All right, so let's super quickly cover the different categories. Uh, serif fonts are any kind of font that has these little feet. Okay, see these little guys? These are serifs. Okay, attached to that font. Okay, I cut them off here to show you, but they are a serif font. Okay, down here where we've got sans serif. Okay, sans is Latin for without serifs. Okay, so this guy has none. It's a Roboto. Nice clean font, the new Arial. Uh, display fonts. This is where the party's at. Okay, this is where all the character in fonts are quite, you, they can get to novelty as a balloon font. Okay, but anything that's not, I don't want to call these boring, okay, but say traditional. Okay, anything that's not gets lumped into here. And there's quite a bit of kind of subcultures within the display. 
Then we move on to uh, script fonts, pretty self-explanatory, uh, often handmade, kind of hand-drawn fonts get put in here as well. Then we get down to monospaced. Monospaced are generally used for kind of like coding or computers, any sort of things like, I don't know, barcodes and computer code, anything that needs monospacing. So can you see the I there in bikes? It's the same width as the B. Whereas further up here, let's have a look. Can you see uh, this I here is a lot thinner than this K here, okay? And for monospacing, they need it like that because computers need to read it. They don't care about kerning and spacing and tracking, uh, especially for things like codes. And let's say this SKU code here for say a product. Okay, if I grab this, okay, and I say actually you are going to be, uh, you know, just some random font and not, they all, they're the same amount of characters, but as soon as I go, all right, you're going to be Roboto, okay, medium. Can you see it changes? They end up being different lengths. And if you're trying to read out like a product code list yourself, it becomes very hard. Now don't disregard them. Like they, they convey quite a bit because they're being used so heavily in kind of computer controlled stuff. They get, let me show you this. Um, so can you see here they've used this kind of mono spacing, this kind of like Orwellian uh, monoculture kind of design thing. And they've turned it in some really nice stuff. I'm just looking on Dribble here for kind of examples, but you can see they've turned some of this like really formal computer stuff into some really beautiful design. So don't overlook mono spaced, but those are the big categories. All right, so that's just a couple of brief overviews of a couple of high level categories. So um, there are lots more like, like for instance, serifs, they, you know, pretty simple going, little feet on them, but really serifs have their own kind of subcategories. There's like, I don't know, old style and transitional and neoclassical, they slab serifs. There's, there's lots to those and they all convey different things and meanings. And while, well, you don't need to learn, like I really want to go in and start talking about them all and maybe doing some font anatomy. It's kind of outside of the scope of this video, but don't be afraid to do it or don't ignore it. And um, because, you know, exploring fonts and what the different styles mean are really helpful for you being able to articulate to a client, to a creative director, you know, what your intention was here, what they're trying to do, how it's connecting with the, you know, the intended audience. That sort of stuff is kind of super important if you are in those kind of situations where you, you know, otherwise you're just picking fonts because they're cool and there's, uh, there's nothing wrong with that. But if you do want to go into meetings and have an opinion, these are the sorts of terms that, yeah, you can explore and get into and be designery about. So knowing our categories, let's look at their competitor analysis to see what categories are going on here. And you can see it's a pretty clear sans serif world. Some, a lot of bold going on, a bit of italics. There's a little bit of uh, display fonts going on. Okay, a little bit of script stuff, display fonts. And not much serifs at all. This Kamalik one has, you know, our good old copper plate, little nib serifs there. Okay, but overall, it's a sans serif world. Now, there's nothing uh, stopping us become, you know, choosing a, I don't know, a cowboy Western font. Uh, but uh, we need to know what kind of the industry says at the moment to kind of anchor ourselves so that we can, you know, if we're going to be disrupting with a font, okay, as, as much as you can with a font, um, you know, we need to be anchored in the sans serif so that we can defend it when we do try and pitch it to the client. And our client will hate a Western font. Um, this, this is my professional experience. Like they're not looking to disrupt. They're looking to fit in and be part of, not be different from. There's no emerging cowboy um, cycle market near us, at least. Like this is rural Ireland. Uh, this is uh, not a different part of the world where I don't know, cowboy bike riding might be a total thing. So I'm gonna start now looking at actual fonts. We're gonna to go to Google Fonts again, and here's categories. You can see Google uses serif, sans serif, display, handwriting, and monospace. We're gonna turn them all off except for sans serif. Well, the opposite of that. Okay, so let's have just sans serif on. You can, by trending, gives you some of the more popular ones to the top. They often can be quite safe, so maybe not perfect for like a brand. You want something with a little bit of character. Um, so maybe trending, most popular, newest, you know, you can flick through these to kind of get a sense of where they are. Uh, I use quite often Adobe fonts. Now this is a paid service. So uh, well, it's paid. It's part of your Adobe Creative Cloud subscription. So it's free if you've already got the Adobe suite. 
Um, so if you do, one of the perks for using this is uh, I'm at the browse fonts, so fonts.adobe.com. And if you scroll down here, they've got their classifications down here. So I can see sans serif, uh, similar to what we're doing on Google fonts. But the nice thing here is there is a broader range of fonts potentially because mm, there are paid ones in here, licensed ones. So there's a, some more commercial ones. Plus you get to tag it with these others and do combinations. So I can say I want it to be sans serif and I'm looking for like a geometric kind of shape. That can be really handy when you are picking your fonts too. Now, if you are paying the Adobe uh, Creative Cloud license, okay, you might want to just use it within the application. So uh, this kind of works the same across Illustrator, Photoshop, InDesign. They all have the same features. Um, some of the other products don't. Um, but let's say that Adair Bikes here that I want to go through character. There's this like little filters option, all of these options that you've never clicked. Let's click on this little funnel here and you can say, Here's the classifications. I can say I want to show everything that's on my computer that is a sans serif font, please. And that is mm, got a heavy weight, okay, bold, okay, or high contrast or great width. Okay, so this is a great way of just categorizing the fonts that you have on your own machine, which is always a drama, right? You've got stuff from everywhere. So that's super handy. Another thing that's quite cool, I'm gonna clear all of these. Let's say that um, one of the things I use quite a lot, let's say I'm just gonna pick one of these script fonts because it's quite dramatic in terms of the changes. So I picked this, I like it, it's good. The client doesn't quite like it, but something similar. So let's say this one's called Bistro Script. Okay, I'm gonna get the same little bit, little arrow to drop it down. I can go through things and say, actually on my machine, please, amazing computer technology, can you go through and, where is Bistro? Um, I had it selected, Bistro, there it is there. Cool, I have it there, can you see this little wavy line? That little magic wavy line is super useful and super hidden. Click on it, it says visually similar. It's gonna go through my whole fonts on my machine and grab me everything that's visually similar. Look at that, oh, Victor script, love that one. That's a super handy trick. If you're close, but you need to find some variants, okay, something like that's really good. It gets better as well, like if you click on this, find more can be super useful. Okay, so this is machine, this is the stuff that's on my current computer. If I go to find more, okay, and I can go into the filters and say, actually give me the sans serif heavyweight ones that have high contrast. It's gonna go through everything that's on fonts.adobe.com and give me those options. Kind of tuck, <laughs> picked it quite an obscure, or no, cut it down too much I think. But you can see here now, the things that are on my machine, okay, you will have either dotted lines to it because you've got parts of it, or it might have a tick next to it. Can't find anything as a tick next to it, but all these ones that have an empty cloud means, hey, download it if you want it. And it's pretty simple, like just go, well, let's say I want, oh, trying to find something exciting. <laughs> all around Gothic, okay, it's okay. Uh, click down, it just magically installs. It pops up here in a second, and you'll have that font from downloaded from the internet on your computer ready to work if it ever downloads. There it is. Those are some handy features. Remember, Illustrator, Photoshop, InDesign have them all. And that show visually similar thing is pretty nice. Now to install the fonts we just saw uh, within Adobe, you can just do it from this character panel. But if you are using the website version, it's much the same. Go into any of the fonts that you like, and there's a little switch here that says activate. Okay, and if you'll be logged in with your Adobe ID, and they just install the same way. It's pretty magic. Google fonts, same sort of way. Go into them, find the one that you like, and there's a little download option, and you can download them onto your computer. Uh, you double click them, open them, double click them again, and they'll install on either Mac or PC. It's pretty easy these days, used to be a pain. That is how to find your categories and how to install them. All right, it's homework time, yay! Uh, we get to pick fonts finally. Uh, so use Google Fonts or Adobe Fonts or whatever fonts you wanna find, and uh, you're gonna pick five in total. Okay, so use the categories that we've learnt about from our kind of competitor analysis and what you decided you want to go for. Tick those boxes and then go through and start searching. Uh, I'll play you mine and I'll I'll dub over the top. All right, so just type in Adair Bikes. I've also done it in uppercase as well as lowercase because I just want to see what the two look like. You see they're kind of like, see them flashing and see them opening up the top here in separate tabs. So that's how I do it. I just go through, smash on anything I kind of like the look of. There is a lot of scrolling and looking vaguely at, you know, fonts, trying to kind of, I don't know, foresee the future of what it might look like. So it's a little bit hard, uh, but uh, it's easier with display fonts. But um, yeah, you can see there, I also started messing around with like the bolds and slants, you know, italics, because I was just trying to see what they look like in those. Then open up all the tabs, download them all, 
unload all the zips, and I just keep clicking on them to install them on a Mac. And eventually, you can put them in anything. I'm using, I'm doing a mood board uh, in Adobe Illustrator because I know how to use it and just because. Uh, but you can use anything. It can be used PowerPoint, whatever you've got in your machine. Google has Presenter, Mac have Keynote. You can line them all up. And I just picked five eventually, kind of cropped it down to five uh, and then kind of spaced them all out ready for the next step. So that's you too. Uh, I've been looking down that whole time, haven't I? Uh, so go off, do your homework, pick five fonts, okay, in your category, line them all up along the top, and we'll move on to the next step. Next thing to talk about about fonts is the families they have. So font families is a way of saying, uh, we know them as like bold and italic. So say uh, Times New Roman has a bold version and an italics version. Okay, so they are all in the same family. They're all Times New Roman, but all in the same gang. So. Some fonts are really liberal and they have loads of extra family members, big families, like Musio. That's why I use it a lot. Uh, it's got, this guy here's got like a, a serif version. There's a sans serif version. There is, a, within that, there's like a light version, a regular, a medium, a bold, a black. There's lots of different weights within that family. Okay, and also gets into like condensed versions, a little skinny one. Uh, what else is there? There is a rounded version. Oh, there's so many, slab. Oh. It's great font. And why that's useful is if I have a font like that, it's quite versatile, okay? I can use it for lots of different things, okay? Lots of different purposes, lots of different use cases, and they all connect, if you know what I mean. Like there's a, a similarity, they're not exactly the same, so we can do it for like titles and subtitles, okay? Some kind of like hierarchy of fonts, all within the same sort of family, but all kind of communicating differently. So that's why I like that one. There are some uh, fonts that have no family, like uh, Burst, Blow. It was called Blow earlier, that guy. Um, it, he <laughs> it doesn't have any family members, sad. Uh, he's a free font from 1001 free fonts, and unfortunately he doesn't have any family members, so there's no bold version. Like Even like Trajan has family members. In a world where the only no. font. <laughs> Too soon. Uh, copper plate has family members. So um, they're not just uh, the weights and the italics, but there's compressed and condensed and like, uh, that's that way, uh, expanded, there's all sorts of versions. So uh, let's jump in and set up some homework and just kind of run through them all because it's good to explore them. So the next bit of homework here is just to list out all the different family members uh, that the font has. So this first font here that I've got, um, Lexend, there were some other versions of it that were very different though, and there was no other family members to this one that I quite like, one of my favorites. Okay, so nothing for that one. Uh, this one here called Kumf, I don't know how to say that, but um, this one here has three, which is cool, so I'm gonna have one, two, three. Okay, so you can hold down the Option key on a Mac, Alt key on a PC while you're dragging down. If you hold Shift as well, it kind of drags them down in a straight line. Okay, so I'm gonna have this first one as light, and the second one, just to explore the different weights, because sometimes, uh, you know, if you don't expand them out, you never go and try them. Uh, and let's say this last one here, or the third one, Railway. Railway is a really complete font. It is a massive big font, look at that. So whoever made Railway, I can go check. Hang on, wait there. There we go, slightly more complicated. It was kind of started by Matt McKinney. <laughs> and then expanded by a bunch of people out. It started life just as the thin weight one. Okay, and then it's expanded out to this gigantic version. Okay, so for this one, we're gonna start at thin and probably skip a couple. Okay, so I'll start there. I'm gonna hold my uh, option key on a Mac, alt key on a PC, okay, and shift, drag out a copy, and then hit command D on a Mac, control D on a PC, and just fire out a bunch of them. Can't really see where we're going now. Command D is, or Control D is just a way of duplicating the last thing you did, which is super handy in Illustrator. So I'm just gonna go through and I'll speed this up, but I'm probably gonna skip every second wait. Okay, just get a sense of them all. There's lots. Okay, there weren't as many, there was a few duplicates in my little font library there, but uh, that is, uh, is it Railway? Railway, anyway. Okay, so go through and do that for all of yours. Just list them all out. And if like this one, that was an easy one. There's nothing for that one. And this kind of rounded version, uh, I'll do these ones as well. Let's speed through it. All 
All right, so there's your homework. Go and do the same. Just kind of spread them out, see what's available inside of it. See what other family members look. One last thing I want to show you before we get off font families is this relatively new, not new, new, but there's something called variable fonts. I can't believe it when I discovered this. It wasn't that long ago. Uh, so I'm in Google fonts. Let's turn it on. What is a variable font? So let's have a look at this first one here. Now we've got all the normal weights, okay, thin 100, okay, light, all the different great sizes. This one's quite complete, has an italics as well. Then we get down to this variable axis. What this means is if you haven't seen it before, get ready. It's knocked some, this knocked my socks off anyway. Uh, so watching over here, and watch this one. I grab the weight and I drag it up slowly. Watch. Holy moly! <laughs> it just gets bigger, okay? Or it gets, uh, the weight gets bigger. There's no like jumping to the next one, okay? So somehow there is some amazingness going on where it's not just like putting a stroker on the outside, right? Like the, the serifs are changing, you know, the shoulders and the terminals are all, they're all adjusting to be more legible and better at this weight, okay? It's just, I couldn't believe it. So if you end up picking a variable font, Okay, it gives you a lot of scope for different weights. Okay, because like the Helvetica that we're looking at before, there was just, you know, I wanted slightly more, I want a variable Helvetica so I can just get a little bit bigger. Okay, I always want the bowl to be not quite, you know, I want it to be bold and a half. Uh, same with this one here, it's got an italics version as well. Okay, which is really where this variable stuff just goes crazy because it's quite hard to keep a, uh, you know, uh, italicized font from getting all smushy when it gets big. But look at that, it's amazing. So in my case, uh, you can like you can download them from here. Uh, Adobe Fonts has them as well. They're not as common, there's not as many around, not as many display fonts around. But let's say in my Illustrator here, I've got, the one I know is already got is Railway, okay? In, in an in Adobe product, can you see there, okay? This is saying this is actually a variable font, Dan. You can, instead of going through this, which it still has, okay, because sometimes you just want it to jump to a thing, you can click on here and look, this one's uh, railway doesn't have italicized, but look, it's the weight. Oh, ho, ho, ho. <laughs> all right. Okay, so that's it for font families. What I want you to do now, next bit of homework is actually go through, pick uh, some font either combinations of weights or just the fonts that you like in the different sizes. Have no more than 10, no less than five. And let's match them up with the logo that we made in the last video. If you don't have a logo, don't worry. Just go through and pick out uh, a group of them that you like, put them to the side so that we can kind of shuffle this off. Now that we've had in a look and see where the different fonts and where they go, uh, let's cut it down to a usable group size. I'm gonna do mine now. Well, there you go. Uh, a couple of things I've learned about myself. Uh, I've never done that whole record myself while I'm working thing until I started the Bring Your Laptop show. So I have learned two things. I have learned that I'm bolder than I think um, from like the intro video where I filmed the back of my head. Don't do that often. Uh, and also that I work with my tongue out a lot. <laughs> Keep watching. All right, so I picked out a bunch of them, uh, and what I realized in that little process is that I really favored the italicized versions, and I wanted to find another one. wasn't happy with all of these, so yeah, uh, I went off to Google and found another. Uh, sorry, Google Fonts found another one. I'm not sure about this breakup here. I'm, I feel like I'm. It's a crutch that I used way too much, kind of using the different weights and then. <laughs> removing the space and the balance between these two is totally not right yet but I'm just looking for fonts I'm getting close to where I want now remember we're designing just one version of a logo concept okay it's not like the complete version I would be going to the con uh, client with a couple of logos a couple of font choices uh, and but I feel like I'm getting close there all right next step all right, let's talk font inspiration. Uh, at the moment, we've been working quite formulaic, you know, coming through the steps and I've got to a point now where I know that I want a, probably a bold sans serif, some sort of italicized, but I don't think I've found the right font. And I find it's better to know that now and go out and look for inspiration than starting with other people's beautiful work and then trying to squeeze fonts where they shouldn't go. So I'm gonna show you a couple of little techniques for finding great uh, fonts kind of in situ so that you might be inspired by and use similar fonts. All right, the first and easiest one is to type in best sans serif bold font, okay, uh, into Google, and see what comes up, uh, and switch to images, and yeah, 
what you'll find is a bunch of other designers, creatives that have gone before us have curated fonts. And often it's uh, really important to see the font in situ, like in being used colors, uh, you know, it can really speak to you differently from like just seeing it on Google fonts. So this is a really important part of my process to find fonts and see them being used. And what I'll be doing now is basically just going through like, in terms of the search, you might decide that uh, depending on what you're doing, you might have to add the word free in there because that's what your budget allows. I've got a paying client and I'm prepared to pay for fonts, so that's okay. Also, you might type in like Google fonts. If you wanna like curate the, you know, find the best fonts on Google fonts or type in Adobe fonts or Envato elements, whatever you're using, you know, as your font kind of place, okay, you might type it. I'm gonna go quite broad. Okay, and then I'm just gonna open a bunch of links and start clicking on them and taking screenshots as the, at, at this stage. I'm not gonna start downloading the font and installing them because A, I like to see them in situ because sometimes the, you know, the, the vibe comes from seeing them being used rather than um, just seeing them straight up um, typed into Illustrator. So that's what I'm gonna do now. I'm gonna go take a bunch of screenshots and I will see you in a second. All right, so I've just kind of like thrown my screenshots here on my font mood board. Uh, another thing I might do is in the last video, uh, the last logo here, I kind of gave out a little bit about copper plate and not liking it, not wanting it. And a few people defended it. I was like, okay, what do I do? The thing I do is similar to what we just did is I'll go to Google, type in copper plate font, hit that, hit images, and just see if I can find some good uses of it. Um, in this case, copper plate is used, the word copper plate is used for a couple of different fonts. We're looking for specifically Gothic font. Gothic is another word for sans serif, I thought. Clearly this has little serifs. Anyway, uh, so yeah, we're looking for Gothic font. Let's look for examples. And you can see there, well, look at that, on the toothpaste, <laughs> Ratatouille. Uh, what else we got? Seabiscuit the movie. Yep, that's pretty nice use. So I can, I'm already gonna say, I might explore it more. I'm probably gonna say no, <laughs> cause it's, it's, I don't know. It feels very pizzeria ratatouille-ish and that's not what we're going for. So I might still abandon it, but you can see there, typing the word examples around fonts that you might have to be using. Okay, you might already have a corporate spec that you have to stick to um, or a font that the, uh, you know, the owner is attached to. And that's a way of kind of figuring out whether find design is better than you have used it and see if you can uh, borrow uh, yeah, use cases and make it look nice. So let's talk font foundries. Uh, a font foundry is just a company that either makes or distributes fonts, okay, shares them around. Now there are big corporate uh, foundries and there are nice little uh, independent foundries. And what they're really good for, it's kind of like, a, I don't know, it's. Uh, window shopping for designers, okay? Uh, it's a place where you can go, have a look uh, at what you might buy, the uses of them. It's quite an exciting time to give yourself a little space to go and explore foundries. Otherwise you end up, you know, you, you can get trapped by just picking fonts that are always trending on Dribbble or Behance. So this is a way of kind of getting out of that and finding other fonts. And also you can find quite meaningful fonts. Um, foundries often will create a font uh, for a specific reason, and often for the independent fonts, they'll have really detailed um, explanations about why they created them. So there's a lots of different foundries you can pick from. I'll show you just a couple of the ones that I normally look at, but there are tons to go and have a little look and, I don't know, get excited by type with. All right, so there's lots of foundries to pick from. These aren't the best ones or the right ones, these are just the ones that I use. Myfonts.com is one, it's owned by Monotype. I feel like monotypes seem to own all the fonts in the world. Uh, so I like it because it's got a really good uh, browse function. Okay, and all the fonts on here are gonna be quite uh, in depth. There's going to be different languages for them. They're gonna have all the extra glyphs and scientific notations that I might need for a font. Uh, it's a little different for this one because I'm doing it for a logo, but uh, in here, serif fonts, I can type in Adair Bikes. Because sometimes there's a like, there's some fonts that I don't like because of, I don't like the G in capitals is or some other thing and yeah, for a logo might not ever come we don't have a g <laughs> so it's fine so i'm going to type in idea bikes and keep an eye on these bits here also for me it's pretty clear already in this one like it, i'm looking for potentially geometric font uh geometric sans fonts 
okay? Because, I don't know, the main part of it for me is the idea, the lowercase a here, looks a bit old worldy when it looks like, see that? Okay, with a, I think it's called a two story a, okay? When it kind of does that, weird way of writing it. Uh, I prefer this more modern style for this brand here. I feel like it, that's what we're looking for. Uh, so, you know, I might go in here and say, actually, I'm going to pick geometric so that I can get, often geometric fonts will have, that's kind of more modern style. And yeah, go through here, take a bunch of screenshots and you got to be prepared. These are paid fonts. So you need to work it into your budget. Uh, you know, if you're doing a $50 logo, there is no budget for picking fonts or paying for fonts. But if you're doing a thousand dollar logo, there's scope for it potentially $10,000. Uh, so you can look into them. They will tell you there's different kind of buying packages. You can buy them all outright, which ends up being quite expensive every single weight. Okay. And individual styles, you can buy just the one you want for this one. Okay, and there's different use cases. So uh, my fonts is pretty nice for commercial fonts. Um, now the, I don't know, independent foundries, there's a lot of them. Google something like best independent foundries 2021 and see what you come up with. Like there's a couple that I use, like this one here, uh, Font Fabric, it's just, a hey, the homepage, look what they've done here. Scrolling back and forth, playing with the weights, super nice. Um, but, and the nice thing about it is they are independent, so are not owned by a big conglomerate like a uh, monotype and again grouping and it's often in these kind of like more independent places you can find fonts that have a little bit more i don't know soul i guess is the word often they'll be designed let's have a look like i'm just having a quick little look through nixa okay and you will find who made it uh info about it why it was created kind of its influences and often that can help empower you when you are deciding on a font and being able to kind of convince a client of why this font is important for you. Uh, seeing it in use cases, really, really um, helpful. Uh, even like this one here, Klim is a foundry. The guy who does most of the design here is a New Zealander. So I have a connection to it because that's where I'm from. And some of the fonts are beautiful. Like it's a, I don't know, it's an exciting part of the process, going and finding fonts and seeing if you find one that A, works with the visuals, but also find something that has a little bit more heart and soul. Okay, uh, oh, geograph. Okay, and again, they're all very similar, as in uh, they'll show you, hopefully, specimens of them being used. Uh, um, in use, a lot of the fonts for this guy are in use, and you can see them the price and um, what they do or he does you can actually download the font he'll email it to you and you can use it and then you license it afterwards once it's been sold into the client so yeah that's a nice way of doing it so yeah look for fonts foundries other foundries are adobe fonts they're a subscription service okay we kind of looked at them earlier and same with google fonts it's a free service but limited Okay, and uh, not as expressive potentially when you've just randomly pick one from Google Fonts. All right, I'm going to take a couple of screenshots and dump them into my uh, mood boardy thing. I keep writing Adobe. <laughs> uh. Oh, and you can see here that you can see this is, has an alternate version. Okay, that has the, they've, you know, they've done the kind of single story A, which is really cool. Anything else that's changed in what I've done? No, the same. So bonus for me. Also, you'll find often a font that is in italicized, okay, or italics is, will have this style A, even though the standy uppy version, there's a technical word for that, I'm sure, but um, has the two story kind of like more curly version. So sometimes the, because I am kind of looking for italics, I think uh, I might get lucky with lots of these um, A's. So there we go. All right, so just throwing them up on my little mood board again. And remember, uh, I guess the important thing is not to start here, start with foundries and going looking for inspiration. It's better to have an idea about what you want and then have a little bit of a, it, an easier time, a narrower search. Um, because I feel like I've exhausted what I want to do in terms of sans serif now. I think over here, it was good. I kind of got I kind of got an idea of it, but it was very pragmatic. And I don't know, the fonts on Google Fonts aren't spectacularly unique. 
Okay, not that a sans serif font in bold italics is, but I found it was really helpful to get here, then to kind of go a bit more exciting here and see how it could be used. And I, know, I find it exciting at least. Uh, but to start here with all the fonts in all the world, it's far too hard. So let's look at the next step. I'm going to see you some homework. All right, next bit of homework is to get inspired. Uh, go out and use the different techniques we used. Uh, you, you probably have an idea of the you know category that you're in now. It might be you know sans serif like me or serif or script or I don't know, birthday fonts. Uh, if you you know once you've got that, type into Google best birthday fonts and see what comes up. Lots of screenshots. Put them in your kind of font mood board. Also look at foundries. Okay, both pay you know kind of like more corporate ones plus some of the independents. Uh, even if you're working on your own project, go and experience that because I don't know, there's going to be a time where you will have a budget, okay, and you need to practice what it feels like sharing part of that budget with, you know, your hard won budget with, I don't know, type designers who spent their kind of like hard work making these things. Uh, it's a great experience for everybody. So go out there, put them all on the board, don't spend more than like 30 minutes, okay, uh, let's be quick about it, and then we'll move on to the next step. Let's talk identifying fonts. Uh, doing it with my own little brain. Uh, there's very few fonts that I actually know like intimately enough, intimately, <laughs> intimately enough to actually just point to and go, "Oh, I know that one." <laughs> okay, so uh, there are some things where the computers can guess them for us. So it might be that you are like walking around and you've seen a poster that you like, and you've taken a photo of it, and you wish you knew what it was, um, or that you've done the screenshots from earlier on in this uh, video but you forgot to take a screenshot of the font name, or you had no idea what it was, but it's on your mood board, there are some automatic things to show you, and I'll show you now. So technology didn't give us hoverboards. I believe we were promised those, and they still haven't delivered, but uh, automatic identification of fonts, it's a close second for designers. <laughs> Let me show you. All right, there's two, three methods. Uh, this one in Photoshop here is a cool feature. So let's say that I've got these just screenshots of things I found on the internet that I like the font of, and I wanted to figure it out. So this one here first, what we can do is, all we do is open it in Photoshop, it's pretty magic, and go to type, and go to this one that says match font. Okay, it's gonna ask us to draw a box around it. I've found uh, sometimes it's good to grab the whole thing, and sometimes just one line. Um, and you can see it kind of over here, updating, look. What has it done? It's found like it found it's found a couple of different ones. So it's found stuff that's already on my machine, and this one's here, the ones that I could download from Adobe Fonts. Okay, part of my uh, like Adobe subscription, and you can see there like I wish you could change this thing. Okay, it just says sample, which I could type in assassin. Okay, but you can see there that S is pretty close. Okay, Orbitron, there's a medium one. I'll download that. Using Adobe Fonts, that's one of the real big perks of it, just installs, it's pretty amazing. Anything else there that I might try? This one here I might try. Okay, and I gotta try and remember them. So you help me. <laughs> I'll ask you in a second. Guillaume, 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 and Orbitron. Let's try Orbitron first. So I'm just gonna cut this out of that, type in uh, Assassin, and it's now, it's actually, because I clicked on it and said download it, it's actually jumped to uh, Guillaume without me doing anything. And I think it's not quite the same. Okay, there's a lot of them, but the A is not working. What was the other one? Orb or something or other. Orb. Orbitron, bold, medium. Oh, look at that. Nailed it. Okay, so it works maybe half the time. Uh, like that, I feel like we might have got it exactly. Often it'll just get you kind of close. Uh, so let's Photoshop. Let me show you kind of like a website version in case you don't have a license for the Adobe Creative Cloud. So uh, I like this version of it. Um, it's called What the Font because <laughs> it's got a great name. Uh, I'm at myfonts.com uh, like earlier. Uh, a lot of different font sites have this now, like font identification. Uh, this one here is particularly good. I think I like the name the best, What the Font. And you can just drag any old thing in there. So this is from my mood board. Uh, I know what the font is here, so we're kind of putting it through the test. It's kind of outlined, you can pick it. I'm gonna select that one, click Identify. And I know it's called Unisans. Where is it? Did it find it? Did not. Oh, it did, there you go. Unisans Heavy, 
I'm just looking matching it up here. You can tell in this way, this one here up here, can you see it's got this like, I think it's called a crotch. <laughs> uh, this little bit here with this, uh, with these two, you know, joints or direction changes or I don't know what you call it, ascenders. There's lots of terminology that I don't quite remember. Uh, but in here, that's quite a giveaway. Unisans heavy. You can see if I can find Unisans in R, uh, it's italic, I think we're going to be there. Well, I know it's there because it's the one I picked. But it's pretty cool, huh? Cool, huh? Does everybody else hear that? Anyway, uh, another thing we can do is let's say that you're at a website. Let's say you're at this amazing website. Oh, wow. Oh, handsome people. And you're like, oh man, that's a great font. Uh, and you want to know what it is? Well, a couple of ways you can do it. Like uh, the easy caveman way is select it. I'm using Google Chrome. Um, you can do this in other browsers. You'll have to figure out the alternative. But you go to view, you go to developer, and we're looking for, um, not view source, we're looking for uh, inspect elements. Okay, so this is into everybody's Chrome. Select the type first. Okay, click on that and you get this big ugly uh, panel here. What we're looking for is yours might open down the bottom or up the top. I'm looking for this one that says computed. Okay, and what it does is you have to just kind of scroll, scroll, scroll through the CSS until you find the font family. You can see it's quicksand. Great font picked by the Bring Your Own Laptop designer, uh, Victoria Burrowdale. Great font that she used to freshen up our site. And yeah, that's the font. If you are like me and do a lot of searching for fonts on websites, it can be just easier to install a little plugin. I'm using this one here called What Font. It's a Chrome extension, you just install it. Then I click on it and I wander around and look, it tells me it's quicksand. Let's look at Behance, okay? Activate font picking device. <laughs> Over above it, Acumen Pro. I can click on it as well and it gives me a little bit more details like the weight. Okay, so it's quite a heavy, bold version where I click on this one. You can see this is the 500. It might be a good kind of type stack for you. Okay, a bit of font pairing, this bold, heavy one with this smaller weight and just lighter version. And uh, yeah, let's look at one more site. Let's look at this one and activate font selection. Okay, this one's called Overpass. Okay, and it's the 800, the heavy version. Up here, what do we got? Open Sans. Okay, uh, yeah, super helpful, a way of just picking fonts that have been used on our website. Next thing I'd like you to consider when you are doing fonts, especially for logos, like we've got 10 characters that are particularly important to us. So we can spend a little bit more time looking at something like glyphs. Now glyphs is a word, there's a different ways you can approach the word glyphs. For us in this case, uh, the best meaning is uh, all the letters Okay, in this particular font, all these characters that aren't on the keyboard. Okay, there's things that we know, you know, there's lots of fonts have extras. Okay, things like there are a lot of languages that require kind of like accents and like New Zealand where I'm from, the, the Māori language has a lot of kind of accents to change the meaning of different, you know, words and letters. Uh, French do it here in Ireland, they have fodders above letters that we need, you know. So often you'll find those in the glyphs panel, which I'll show you where it is in a second. They're all kind of like things that aren't particularly on the keyboard. Um, other things that might, you know, that get included in there, they might be uh, things like scientific notations, you know, like fractions and I can't think of any <laughs> sciencey things, math equations, the infinity symbol, there's lots in, you know, that in a font that don't appear on your keyboard. So we can find those hiding in the glyphs panel. Where it gets really exciting for us, in particular for, you know, uh, logos is kind of stylistic alternatives. So where there is, remember we looked at the kind of like, uh, there was the, you know, single story and the two story A, okay? Same for the G, there's, you know, there's, there might be that other version in the glyphs panel, okay, as extras. Sometimes it can get quite elaborate as well. So let's dig in and let's have a look at how to find them and how to use them. All right, so I'm inside Illustrator. Mm, works the same in Photoshop, InDesign. Not all programs have it, glyphs panel. Uh, a lot of type-based ones will. So let's have a look at any of these ones. Uh, let's grab this one. Okay, and let's, I'm gonna try and duplicate it because I know I'm gonna wreck it. With it selected, go to type and go to glyphs. Weird word, no vowels. And you can see in here, 
whatever you have selected here will show you all the glyphs. Some are going to be pretty complete, some of them are going to be pretty short. Often, have you seen like in your font list, there's sometimes a pro version and you're like, what's the difference? This one looks exactly the same, you know, um, as the pro version. The pro version will have all this extra, um, you know, all these extra glyphs. You can see for us, what's in here? All the different extra accents for different languages. Okay, it gets into even some Cyrillic letters, all the kind of uh, different, you know, uh, yen and euros, things that are hard to find on your keyboard, some scientific stuff, some punctuation, okay, that's required. Here's yeah, some fractions. I haven't actually used any of them. If I just click in this type box here and double click on half, you can see they get added. Now, in terms of, like, this is a boring old sans serif font, so the glyphs are pragmatic. Is that the word I want? No, just practical. So what I want to do, let's say that I'm doing something a little bit more exciting, like uh, I, instead of doing bikes, I was doing Scott Cola. Okay, and I get to play around in the uh, filters. Let's have a look at some of the script ones. Okay, and decide on, I don't know, which one? Let's have a look here, maybe this one. Spumantine? <laughs> I know I've murdered that one. It's kind of Cola-ish. And the cool thing about this, check out this glyph panel. Ooh, ooh. Okay, and the nice thing about in here is that it, it's done a couple of things already uh, without me asking. So it is a font that has something called ligatures. They're hidden in here. They're separate, they're replacement. So instead of having like a T and a T, can you see it's replaced it with this lovely double up? So the type design has actually said, all right, if there's a two T's together, I'm gonna make this like different version, this alternative for it. It's called a ligature and it switches out automatically in some software programs like Illustrator because it's a really type based program. So can you see here like that is fine, but not as nice as that. And it just happens automatically. Uh, if yours isn't doing it and you are an Illustrator, okay, let's have a look. Uh, you can turn it on under window. Uh, where is it? Window type and go to open type. Okay, and over here, turn these little buttons on. Not all of them will be activated, it'll depend on your font. Some fonts won't have any ligatures, okay, or in here, contextual alternatives. So let's watch this. I've highlighted it and I turn them off. Okay, can you see it goes back to regular? Whereas this, okay, what's also really nice in here is the alternatives for, let's say, this A. If we hold on to it and we want to have a little look in here, let me make it bigger for you. Yeah. <laughs> I've lost it. There we go there. Can you see there's all these different A's? And that's fine, but say I'm trying to do something a bit more logo-y and you want to end with this like flourish. Wee, look at that. Okay, and you want to maybe try a different L as well. Have a look in the font. You might find stuff that you like better. I don't like that one better. Okay, uh, Colter, Colter, Colter. Uh, but this is how you can find some of those beautiful like uh, ligatures that end up kind of like wrapping around and linking and joining different parts, they can be found here in the glyphs panel. Another cool thing you can do in Illustrator is go up to preferences. Yours might already be on. Uh, so edit preferences on a PC and go up to Illustrator preferences on a Mac, go to type. There's a last one here, it says show character alternatives. This is really handy because then you can highlight things and can you see down here, it's given me and it's dug them out of the glyphs panel, so I don't even need to leave. So you might decide to ruin it by whacking that in there. <laughs> okay, or let's say this S is not doing it for me. Okay, I want something a little bit simpler. Oh, it's cool to be able to do that without busting out the old pen tool, driving yourself insane. All right, last one. I need to save the C. <laughs> oh, I'm not sure. Yeah, I don't like the curly bits. So that's doing it for me. All right, so that's the Glyph panel, a little secret treasure of character goodness. All right, it is homework time. Uh, early in the video, you went through and did that like font mood board. Remember when you took lots of screenshots and kind of put them all up on the page of, you know, Google searching as well as different foundries. What I want you to do now is have a look at those and decide actually, you know, you'll find a lot of them are very similar and not worth having like different alternatives for. Find three to five of them that are, you know, unique, that can kind of stand on their own two feet and be obviously different. Find those, now go to the trouble of finding them, downloading them, and start typing them out to go with that kind of first lot that we did earlier in the video. So use things like the glyphs panel now, you might have to identify those fonts, and I want you to add them to our kind of like final group of 
uh, finalists of fonts and do that and I'll see you in the next bit. All right, so I've done my homework. These are the original ones we did earlier in the video and this is the ones where I've gone and pulled fonts from uh, these kind of inspiration board here. Let me quickly tidy this stuff up. All right, so these are the ones I ended up picking. Uh, what did I end up going for? Big John was a free one. It was this one, let's have a look there. Okay, came with Big John and Slim Joe. I used Big John. It's a strange old font. Uh, it's got some, I don't know, some strange widths going on, inconsistent, or oh, something about that R. Anyway, uh, what else? I grabbed Noma. This one here was Signica. That was another Google font. That one there, Mosque, got from Behance. This one here is Bison. I really am falling in love with Bison. Uh, as a f like, it's a paid font. There's a free version. There's like a bold uh, straight. Okay, but I really wanted the italicized one, and I wanted the outline version. So I went and bought it. I was, I think it was thirty dollars. It was, I think the Ellen Luff. That was it. Uh, she made this one, and ah, I'm falling in love with it. It's saying the right things to me. I'm not sure we can go for the outline, but um, I'm not sure. Next thing we're going to do is we need to move forward. We've got too many fonts. It's good. We've narrowed them down. And next thing we're going to do is just pick out three from here to do some mock-ups with. So I want you to go through and just kind of circle on your own one. Of all the stuff you have so far, go and circle the three that you want to kind of move on to the next part of the course with. And I'm going to stay in here and look at these and decide. I find it's easier to exclude fonts than it is to pick them, except for this one. You are sold. I'm basically just going to deliver this one to the client. But let's go through the motions of the other ones and see what we've got. And we'll, yeah, we'll set up three of them in the next little set. All right, fast forward a bit. All right, got it down to four. <laughs> it's easy to exclude. I can't break it down any further than this. I think I need to move on with this four. Hey, broke my own rule. It's just a, it's a silly rule anyway. Uh, so let's uh, do some a little bit more work. Let's actually, the balance of these, like this one here is just kind of whacked down here. I'm going to do some, a little play around with these logos just to get the type stack Right, I'm going to play around with two lines, one line, and adjusting it to match the bird. You know what I've done? Design a logo that you can't line type up with. Stupid bird. All right, here's my final four, and can't do it. You're out. You're being kicked out of the group, buddy. Big John. All right, down to three. So these are the three that I'm going to kind of move on with and stick them in situ, see what they look like in use, and see whether I can pick a winner to present to the client. All right, let's do that next. All right, let's mock them up in situ. We've got a couple of options to pick from. I want to see what they look like in just different circumstances. Like, uh, we'll mock them up. You know, I like to see them on the staff's clothes, maybe on a bike, on some signage, and uh, we'll mock it up just to see whether some of the logos do well in that situation and make sure I'm not also designing myself into a corner. You've got a kind of a format that just, it's really awkward to lay out so we can scrap that one. And I'm just looking for a winner really that I could present to the client. Now I won't take all three you know, font choices, and what I'd be doing in this process is I'd have, you know, from the last video, I would have done, you know, three to five different logos and with three to five corresponding fonts. Okay, so let's mock it up now. I'll show you what I do to kind of get a feeling for whether this logo is going to work and yeah, helps me, yeah, visualize it. Let's do that. Now, there's no right way or wrong way of mocking these things up. Um, I'll show you a couple of tips that I use to mock them up. So uh, a good place for kind of free commercial use images is Unsplash. Okay, so I just typed in shopping bag and eventually found this guy here, downloaded it. Thank you, Kelly uh, Sakima. Thank you very much. And uh, let's open her up. All right, so first of all, this one here has a really like Instagram-y low exposure 
Uh, I'm just gonna use my levels to bump it up. This is not gonna be a Photoshop tutorial. I've got plenty of those. Uh, so I am gonna grab my logo from Illustrator. Okay, and which one should I grab? Um, we'll start with, I don't know, this one here. Copy it and just paste it straight into Illustrator. Just make sure when you are pasting it in, it's a smart object so that you can change it later on. Don't hold shift, line it up. So, something like this. What I like to do as well when I do get it kind of where I want is to get it to blend a little bit with the background texture at the moment. It's pretty obvious it's fake. Uh, so with the layer selected here under, not name, <laughs> uh, under normal, just kind of cycle through these until you find, and when I say cycle, you just hop above them now. Okay, until you find one that seems to, okay, hover above them, any of them. Overlay, can you see how overlay is actually kind of bringing the you know texture of the bag through? It's probably a bit light, so I'm gonna duplicate it by just dragging the layer onto the new layer panel, get two of them, and maybe turning this top one down, the opacity down a bit, just to kind of have this balance of those two. Uh, so the, yeah, that's my kind of, maybe a little bit more. So I'm doing things like this, okay, and I'm thinking hmm, to myself, is this, what am I, am I liking this in this situation? And I'm gonna work through a couple of different logos as well. Um, actually, what I wanna do is I wanna show you one more thing before I do some zoom designing, uh, is this is just kinda of like flat sticking it on the top. What you can find in, especially Photoshop, is you can find templates. So uh, free versions of these can be found, but often the good ones are premium and paid. So I pay for my Adobe, stock license every month, okay? And it gives me access to things like this. I'll show you, let me grab one. Uh, so the site looks like this. I can in here do things like, uh, let's go to templates, and let's for like logo mock-up. You'll find some really cool stuff, just to be fast, okay? All of these, you can see just, it's really awesome. And um, let's look at, this one here have I licensed, this one here I licensed. Okay, and I'll show you this work through together and then I'll do a few more um, just in kind of speed mode. So let's look at that one. So somebody's mocked this up for us and the cool thing about using a smart object is this little icon in the corner means you can double click it, okay, and go and change it. So double clicking it, okay, goes me, it opens up in another tab. Now I can grab one of my logos, okay, from Illustrator. Let's grab this one, copy it, bring it in, paste it as a smart object. Okay, scale it to an appropriate size. And I'm gonna turn off that logo, and I'm gonna change that color. So in here, in the effects panel, I've done some sort of color overlay thing. It's cool, but it's not what I want. I want some sort of gray version. We'll do color in the next video, but at the moment we're sticking just a monochrome. Save it, and if I go back to this original tab, this is where the magic happens, you ready? I love this, every time I see it. I've done it a million times. Look at that, look at the blur in the background and it feels real, okay? The designer for this one has gone through and done a bunch of stuff here in the layers panel, okay, blur out. You could do this all yourself, okay? But I'm just doing for quick mock-ups, so templates, awesome. So I'm gonna run through a couple of different mock-ups and I'll show you as I, you know, I'll show you what I end up with just, and we can all have a look and see whether we feel like one has more legs than the next, all right. All right, so that was kind of like 30 minutes of mocking up things. Now everyone's skill level is gonna be different. Um, I'm pretty fast at this, but um, yeah, I really wanna go through and show you full tutorials on it all, but I've done that loads. Uh, there'll be a link to the description for my Photoshop courses. Uh, but what do you feel? How do you feel? How do I feel? It was pretty, felt pretty natural to exclude one during that mock-up. Like this one here is, it's an average font and I don't think the logo should be on that right, personal opinion. Um, it's either one of these two. I like both of them. I feel like I can do more with this kind of inverted thing. You know, I like it kind of stacked. It, it can work on its own. I can imagine it down the, like, um, I don't know what you call it, the, the top brace on a bike, you know? Um, so, you know, it's a long and thin, and, you know, I think it'll work for lots of those applications that they do need for a bike shop. Um, so I'm probably, yeah, uh, I feel like I'm gonna go this way. This one's a second, a close second. I do like it more mocked up than I did not mocked up. 
Um, yeah, let me know your opinions. Which would you go for? <laughs> let me know in the comments. I'm gonna stare at this for a little bit longer. All right, it is homework time, your homework. Uh, I want you to kind of get to the stage where I'm at now, where you pick one that you like the most. Okay, so mock it up, pick three, okay, from your font uh, ex uh, exploration, and then mock those three up in different ways, and then kind of hopefully pick one. And don't worry about your skills in terms of mocking it up. Like, everyone's gonna have different skill levels. It might be a chance or a time now to like upgrade your Photoshop skills. Okay, but even if it's just moving it around on a, on a business card, uh, those stock library sites, okay, the ones that we got the paid stuff from, um, especially Adobe stock, they have some free options. So go check out that site. There's a free um, part of it. Um, loads of the great ones are paid. Uh, Unsplash, remember, is another great place. I'll put links to all of those in the description. So yeah, mock them up, decide which one that you like the most and share it. I'd love to see it. So uh, here's my social medias, okay, whichever one you use the most, tag me in it. Uh, if you want really, if you want feedback, the, probably the best place is the Facebook group. There'll be a link to that in the description. And so post not only your kind of mock-ups of the one that you've picked, but actually explain why. Show some of the process through other photographs, okay, screenshots, but actually describe it with your words. That's probably one of the hardest things to do at this stage, you know, especially when you're new, is, is to kind of actually verbalize the reasons and try and convince others of it and use use the Facebook group as a, you know, a reason to uh, practice that. And also go through, and if you see anybody else's, contribute to them as well, give them feedback. Uh, so do your three mock-ups, share one of them, okay, in the different kind of institutes, ask for feedback from the Facebook group, and yeah, I'll see you in the next step. Hello. Say hi there, hello. wave that way, hi. hi. That was the creative director. <laughs> He's always over my shoulder, make the logo bigger. All right, so yeah, that's my process. Not the process or the right process, just my process. And what I hope is that there might be just one or two things in there that you can kind of like pluck out and put in your own process, you know, uh, to kind of, you know, so that you, you work on your own way of building logos. Um, you know, what we did work out was that the brief was super important. Uh, knowing the um, you know the target audience and you know doing that competitor analysis really helped us figure out what kinds of fonts we're looking for and you know some creative boundaries are super important because it allowed us to go to those foundries know what kinds of fonts we're looking for not just every font and also that the fun part where you start looking at other people's like inspiration other designers what they've done with the fonts we've got some you know we've got some kind of blinkers that we can actually focus and narrow down some fonts and for me also like the in situ part like actually mocking them up and seeing what they actually look like and work like in real life potentially is something that I find super useful. All right, let's talk next steps uh, for you. The next video in this series is gonna be looking at picking our colors for our logo. So my process for that. Uh, there'll be a link in the description for that when it is out. Uh, also, you might consider joining bringyourownlaptop.com. Uh, especially at the moment, we've got a fun uh, design challenge, a logo design challenge. We are redesigning our local takeaways, kind of moving it from cheap to gourmet expensive, which is pretty fun. Uh, also, you might decide it's time to kind of raise your level in terms of your skills on the computer. So there is both an essentials and advanced course for Photoshop and Illustrator. There's also some exclusive podcasts there as well, uh, where we, especially at the moment, I've been interviewing people about logo design and branding, and it's been really amazing for me to learn so much, so check those out too. Uh, also, people are gonna ask where I got the shirt from. Um, it is from The Future, you probably know them. Uh, Chris Doe, Matthew, Ben, uh, I'll put a link to it in the description. And Dan, remind them to like and subscribe. Actually, I like to just, hide it in the video so that the audience like to they find it. it's like little easter eggs are hide in there do they know about the links in the description everybody knows where the links are good